When I was eight years old, my mom and dad purchased a home located in Burlingame, California. They got a great deal on the house and were thrilled at its location and the town. I recall the first time I entered the house. I said to my mom, it's so dark in here. My mother reassured me that with a little paint and new drapes, it would be bright and sunny. I think that the darkness I noticed wasn't just because of the dark walls and drapes. There was something much darker hidden in the seams of the house. This darkness didn't stay hidden for long. Before we moved our belongings into the home, my dad and one of his friends, Dick, went to the house to refinish the hardwood floors. They were in for a challenging set of experiences. When they turned on the sander, the radio would blast. When they turned off the radio, the light would go on. Then, the electricity would shut off. They checked the fuses, but none of them were burnt out. My dad called the power company. The man who came out said there was nothing wrong with the connection from the power pole to the house. He told my dad that he needed to call an electrician. The electrician witnessed the strange and inexplicable relation between unrelated switches and the responses from remote locations throughout the house. The electrician told my dad that the entire house needed to be rewired. To their surprise, after this announcement, all the electrical appliances and lights worked as expected. All returned to normal operation at that time. This stunt repeated many times over the years. We just had to wait it out because there was nothing wrong with the fuses, fuse box, the connection to the power pole. There was no technical explanation. I will say that being in a totally dark house due to the actions of invisible intruders was quite terrifying. We were at their mercy, and they had little to no mercy. After we moved into the house, we immediately noted at times it sounded as someone was walking across the floor, or there would be what sounded like knocking on various doors throughout the house. The back door would open and slam closed, which would be followed by what sounded like footsteps coming up the stairs. My parents explained to me the sounds were the sounds of the house settling. Often when I went to bed at night, I would hear heavy breathing right by my face. My parents told me this was what the water heater sounded like at night when it was heating the water. I would hear my mother call, and when I answered, she would say she didn't call me and vice versa. I often found long auburn hairs in my bedroom. I couldn't figure this out. I didn't know anyone with that color hair. My parents became acquainted with the next door neighbors. They commented to mom and dad that they hoped that they lived there longer than the other people that had moved in. The house had always been sold, never rented, but it was rare for any family to live there more than three months. The neighbors had lived next door for over 20 years. There were times when I woke up with someone holding onto my ankles and pulling me off the end of the bed. This terrified me. When I told my parents, they assured me that I was only having a nightmare. I woke up in the morning to find pieces clipped from my hair. This left short, jagged pieces I couldn't style. My mom told me this was from the pin curls I used. One afternoon I was in my bedroom and couldn't shake the feeling that someone was staring at me. This gave me the creeps so I decided to go out into the living room. In that I felt so uneasy I stepped down the first step in front of the door and reached around the corner to turn off the light. When I turned off the light I saw a young woman sitting on the bed right next to where I had been sitting. She had long auburn hair. She was transparent. I didn't believe in ghosts. My parents had told me over and over again there was no such thing. Now I was faced with the terrifying reality of a ghost sitting on my bed. I ran to the front bathroom, slammed and locked the door. Then it dawned on me that if she was a ghost, and what they say about ghosts was true, she could just walk through the wall and I would be locked inside with her. I locked the I unlocked the door and ran to the living room in the front of the house. In the morning I told my parents about my experience. They exchanged glances and then they told me they knew the house was haunted. 
The ghost I described to them was the only one that they call Florence. It took about three years to believe the house was haunted. They didn't believe it until they exhausted themselves by sneaking through the house trying to find the intruders, making all the noises, and never finding anything. Then, one night, when they had just gotten into bed, turned off the lights, and above the end of the bed were two floating heads staring at them. They both saw these apparitions and could not deny what they saw. This put them on a trek of using a Ouija board to try and communicate with the ghosts. Knowing what I do now about the response to this board by earthbound spirits, I am certain this practice only made things worse. There were many ghosts. I only saw two fully manifest apparitions, but my parents saw and experienced many more. I saw things, but only two specific ones. It was a common experience to see items such as books flying across the room. One time my mom was taking a nap on the couch in the living room. The couch seemed to be shaking. She opened her eyes and discovered the couch was being transported by floating across the room with her on top of it. One could explain doors opening and closing by themselves being due to not being latched properly and a breeze caused it to open and close. This explanation could not be applied to the sliding door between the second and third bedrooms. The sliding door often slammed open and closed. This was very unsettling. Quite a few times my parents came into my room in the middle of the night to see why I was screaming. I was not aware of screaming. As far as I knew, I was sound asleep. They would describe the screaming as if I had seen a bloody head rolling across the floor. There were times my parents acted out of character. They would be much harsher than one would expect. Shortly before my mom passed away, she told me that the change of life made her strange. I asked her what she meant, and she told me that at one time she was chatting across the picket fence with our elderly neighbor. She said that it took all her strength to force herself to go back into the house without attacking and strangling the neighbor. I told her, Mom, that wasn't the change of life, it was the ghosts. The ghosts made them say and do things that were out of character. I could see it in their eyes and their mannerisms, that they were different, not themselves. I experienced time when I was attacked, pushed, and manhandled by the ghosts. I told my parents and they told me I was letting my imagination run away with me. Their invalidation of my experiences made life very difficult for me as there was nowhere to turn for help. Family and friends that visited were often treated to a ghost experience from simple footsteps and door knocking to have their blankets pulled off of them in the middle of the night by unseen hands. One time my aunt was at our house for my birthday party. It was too late for her to drive all the way home but she didn't want to sleep in the house. She slept out in our travel trailer with my teenage slumber party. One time we were watching television when Hans Holzer and Sybil Leek were visiting San Francisco. They were ghost hunters. They announced that if anyone thought their house was being haunted, that they would be glad to come and get rid of the ghosts. I begged my parents to call them. They didn't want to because they didn't want anyone in the area to know the house was haunted. They said that when they sold the house that was such information would prevent them from getting a good price. I was so hopeful then crestfallen. When my parents retired and put the house on the market, the ghosts became especially active. We had occupied the house for 15 years and I think the ghosts were pretty happy with the arrangement. He told my mom that he wanted to move into the travel trailer so they didn't have to be concerned with constantly cleaning and preparing for the stream of realtors streaming through the house with potential buyers. Then one morning, my dad announced that he was lowering the price on the house by a considerable amount. We all tried to discourage him from doing so since they were counting on the profit from the sale to buy retirement property and perhaps build a home. He wouldn't listen to our arguments. The house sold that day. 
Mom and I were sitting in the kitchen while Dad walked the new owners out to their car. Mom and I heard the back door open and slam closed. We heard footsteps coming up the back steps. We got up together and looked down to the hall to the stairway. We could still hear the footsteps ascending the stairs, but there was no one to be seen. After they moved all their things out of the house, handed over the keys, and had left the property for good, Dad confided why he insisted on moving into the trailer and lowering the price on the house. The night before they moved out into the trailer, my dad was startled awake by a hand over his mouth and nose. He was being suffocated by the man-ghost, who we had come to call Dave. Dad was a strong guy, but he said it took all the strength he had to wrestle away from the grip of the ghost. Dad turned to me and apologized for not believing me. We heard that the first renter in the house was a minister. I was elated thinking that a minister might pray the ghost out of the house. The minister moved out almost as fast as he moved in. After a series of short-term renters, the house was replaced by an apartment building. Neighbors told my parents that the house had been moved. I don't know if the house was moved, and if it was moved I wondered if the ghosts go with the house or haunt the apartment building on the site. I know I would never want to go back and find out for myself. This all happened during this past summer here in Cardiff, UK. At about 7 p.m., my friend and I decided to go into the woods at Heath Park, as we were very bored that day, and I believe it was one of the hottest days on record for the UK, so we were very hot and bothered. We trekked into the woods until we came to a huge tree. We sat by the tree for nearly an hour cooling down. It was also next to a large pond. At about 9 p.m. we realized that it was very nearly dark, so we decided to make our way back home. We had about a 15-minute walk to get back out of the woods, and nothing strange had happened until I noticed a figure, about 200 yards away from us, back from where we had just come from. I thought this was strange, but thought nothing more of it. About 4 or 5 minutes later, I looked back and saw the figure again but this time it was closer. I thought this was strange as there were no people close to us when we were at that tree, so I decided to tell my friend Josh, and he thought I was messing around with him and didn't believe me at all. This was much to my frustration. At about three or four minutes later, again I looked to the side and the figure was about 50 yards away, only it was amongst all the nettles and bushes. I was really scared at this point as we weren't even halfway through the journey and it was nearly dark. I told Josh to keep looking around and to speed up our walking pace. A few minutes later Josh saw the figure on the other side of us. We were both really scared so we ran. When we got into the open field which would lead us to a road, we ran about halfway into it and looked back and we both saw the figure standing on the edge of the woods. We ran all the way home. The figure that we saw was very weird, because every time I saw it, it was perfectly still. We could not make out the face or gender of this thing. It was just in what looked like a blue cloak. I've been back to the spot a few times since that day, and nothing strange has happened. But me or Josh will no, not go back there at dusk again. My grandmother had to wear a special shoes because of a surgery on her leg that made one leg a couple inches shorter than the other. This resulted in a shuffle thump noise that was very distinctive when she walked anywhere in our house, as we had hardwood floors throughout. One night I was in from college, at least a year after she passed away, and I was sleeping on the couch in the living room. It adjoins the kitchen in our very small house, and I heard a shuffle thump make its way down the hall into the kitchen where it stopped, and the coffee maker turned on. My grandma was a coffeeholic, 
I can only assume there's no caffeine on the other side. If you like what you heard, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends. If you'd like to, you can follow me at Twitter. The handle is at Fuzzy Pantaloons. And I'll see you all next time.